This absolutely takes the cake for the most melodramatic plot twist in Prison Break. And it's also the one that got roasted by the netizens the most. From the sparks of love struck between Michael and Sarah in Season 1, to Michael being thrown into Sona Prison in Season 2 to save Sarah, followed by Michael successfully breaking out of prison in Season 3 and embarking on a lone quest for revenge for his girlfriend Sarah. And finally, in Season 4, the two of them walking on the beach, finally relieved of their burdens. The last page of the prison break epilogue showing Michael and Sarah officially entering the Hall of Marriage brought immense happiness to countless fans. Yet, to save his pregnant wife, Michael once again plunges into the abyss, just when everyone thought Michael was dead. Prison Break Season 5 makes a comeback after 8 years. However, Sarah suddenly remarries with Michael's child Mike in tow, leaving many fans disappointed in her while also feeling sorry for Michael, who was presumed dead. What Sarah never expected was that the man she had shared a bed with for 7 years was the mastermind behind Michael's fake death. Seeing the photo of the assassin taken by Teabag, Sarah is utterly dumbfounded and can hardly believe her eyes. At that moment, she suddenly remembers Mike is still at home and frantically runs towards her house. Luckily finding Mike safe, an anxious Sarah makes up an excuse to take Mike away. And just then, her husband Jacob arrives. Sarah lets Mike hide in the car and then gets straight to the point by showing him the photo. Jacob, adept at game theory, hurriedly explains that he found the phone, which was hacked at the phone store. To keep Sarah and the child from danger, he had a friend in the computer science department trace the killer's phone back. And then he contacted the killer, hoping to resolve the issue with money. But Sarah, unable to listen, steps on the gas and decisively leaves. Sarah takes Mike to her friend Heather's house and confides everything to her. But Heather suggests she might be overthinking due to recent events. First, she was attacked by a home invading killer. And then she saw evidence that Michael was alive. All of which could lead to a mistaken judgment. Heather mentions Jacob seems like a good man who gave her a new life. Heather asks for the name of the person who helped recover Jacob's phone data, mentioning she knows a professor at that school. Thus, through Heather's connections, Sarah meets Jacob's friend Andrew. Sarah politely inquires if he helped recover the phone data for Jacob, and Andrew confidently confirms he did, which matches Jacob's explanation. Just then, Sarah receives a call from Jacob who anxiously asks her to come to the police station, and Sarah agrees to meet him. The police chief says they've caught a few suspects and asks victim Sarah to identify the assailants. Sarah decisively points out numbers 3, A.W., and 4, Van Gogh. Jacob then reiterates to Sarah that he's just a husband worried about his wife, not the Poseidon she mentioned. Jacob also presents the $100,000 he prepared to bribe the assassin, saying he had installed a tracker without the assassin's knowledge. Thanks to his calling the police in advance, they were able to easily arrest them. Hearing Jacob's flawless explanation, the naive Sarah chooses to believe him and once again embraces him. However, as soon as Sarah and Jacob leave, the prison guard releases A.W. Poseidon got you out first. I thought I was his favorite. The two assassins have already received news of Udi's escaping from prison and have killed a terrorist leader who escaped with them. Abu. Van Gogh. Confused asks why there was infighting. But A.W. says in their line of work, you just follow orders and don't ask questions you shouldn't. Clearly, they are unaware of the truth behind their actions. They are merely Poseidon's tools for murder. At this point, they've already received Poseidon's order to kill the terrorist Udis, who has just escaped from prison, also known as Michael, now on the run in Yemen, just now. They successfully escaped Ojijia prison in Yemen, and with the cooperation of their companions, they also killed Abu, the leader of terrorists in the Middle East. In a bid for revenge for Abu, the terrorists put up an $80,000 bounty for capturing Michael and his crew. Driven by faith and money, they crazily started to hunt down Michael and his companions. Michael led them to a hidden basement to replan their escape route. He was planning to head north by train as previously planned, but Lincoln knew that area was already occupied by terrorists. Lincoln suggested that Michael follow him to the airport to meet with Benjamin. However, Michael believed the airport, being the quickest way out of the country, would surely be controlled by the terrorists first. So, he stuck to his own opinion and did not agree with Lincoln's suggestion. At this moment, Lincoln suddenly exploded in anger. For the first time, he lashed out at Michael and demanded, Why are you still alive? What exactly happened? Today, if you don't clarify everything, we're not going anywhere. Michael had no choice but to reveal the truth. It turns out, just weeks before his wedding to Sarah, he received a call from the mysterious agent Poseidon. He said Paul had no judicial authority to pardon their crimes, 
using this as leverage over Michael in a legal sense. Poseidon threatened that unless Michael worked for him, he could legally send Michael and his companions back to prison, this time for life without parole. Michael explained that Poseidon was a disgruntled policy expert at the CIA. This psychopath, to maximize his ideas, secretly created an organization within the CIA called 21 Void for his own use. He exploited Michael's talent for breaking out of prisons to free terrorists around the world to achieve his own ends. Initially, Michael did not agree to Poseidon's demands, resulting in Sarah being locked up in a women's prison and brutally beaten by the guards. Seeing his pregnant wife beaten like that, Michael had no choice but to compromise with the sinister Poseidon, sacrificing himself for his family's freedom. At this moment, the terrorists' gunfire sounded outside, and the group stealthily made their way to the train station. The place was swarming with terrorists. Lincoln again urged Michael to head to the airport, but Michael argued that the most dangerous place could be the safest. Seeing the porters moving things to the train station, he decided to disguise himself as a porter to blend in. Unfortunately, halfway there, terrorists stopped Lincoln to question him. Since Lincoln didn't speak their language, any attempt to communicate would blow his cover leaving him no choice but to strike first. Then, they frantically ran for their lives. Using the train as cover, seeing a train approaching, Michael urged them to run to the other side of the train, narrowly escaping. However, what they did not expect was that Cyclops had already set his sights on them. Just now, Cyclops had approached his leader, claiming he had seen the man and could help track down the assassin, but the leader mocked him for being one-eyed and did not take his words seriously. Feeling slighted, Cyclops found the auto repair shop where Michael had studied the prison break plan. From the map, he deduced they were likely at the train station, which led him to track them down. He sent the photo he took to his leader, saying, Bring your weapons. I call the shots now. Meanwhile, Benjamin, along with Sheba and her family, arrived at the airport, which was in complete chaos, with flights unable to take off normally. Worse still, terrorists suddenly stormed the airport, sending everyone into a panic. At that moment, Benjamin saw a pilot stripping off his uniform, seemingly planning to escape alone in a plane. Thus, Benjamin, along with Sheba and others, followed him, but the pilot was quickly spotted by terrorists. Benjamin hiding behind the car was also discovered. Just as the terrorists were about to shoot, Sheba rushed in, claiming she had seen the killer of Abu. Taking advantage of the terrorists' diverted attention, Benjamin suddenly fought back quickly taking down several of them, thereby saving the pilot. As a token of gratitude, the pilot agreed to help them escape the country. Meanwhile, the lucky-to-be-alive Michael planned to take them to another train station. Lincoln again tried to persuade Michael to go to the airport since it was only an 8-kilometer journey from there, whereas escaping north to the border was hundreds of kilometers away. But the stubborn Michael still trusted his intuition because he believed it was his intuition that had kept him alive until now. After saying this, Michael quickly got into the car, ready to head north. Although some teammates thought Lincoln made sense, Michael's position in their hearts was hard to shake, so they all followed Michael north. Reluctantly, Lincoln, unable to persuade his brother, also got in the car, but they hadn't gone far when they were suddenly stopped by a car crash, caused by Cyclops who had been tracking them. They hurriedly escaped into a hospital and then split up to look for a way out. Just reaching the basement, Michael suddenly saw a ventilation shaft next to him, but despite using all his strength, the cover wouldn't budge. At that moment, Cyclops had already barged in with terrorists, and Michael realized his decision was a mistake. He tearfully confessed to his brother Lincoln, he had intended to bear all the consequences alone, but instead, he made things worse for those around him. He once, like a ghost, secretly watched his wife and Mike in the park, too afraid to show himself. At that moment, Michael, in tears, regretted not discussing strategies with his brother from the beginning. Lincoln, of course, forgave Michael, then pulled him up and handed him a wrench. Whip had sharpened a knife, ready to fight at any moment, but only Jaw remained calm and collected, holding a can of oxygen and a bucket of alcohol, singing while sprinkling the alcohol on the floor. Lincoln and Michael were eager to try. Just then, the terrorists, attracted by the singing, hurriedly changed direction. They came to the source of the singing and shot at the silhouette, which turned out to be a dummy made of human bones, hiding an oxygen tank inside that exploded upon being shot, giving the terrorists a free spark show. After experiencing the life and death situation, Michael decided to adopt Lincoln's plan and head to the airport. So, he called Benjamin to clarify the exact location, asking them to wait a bit longer. However, 
The situation at the airport was already dire, as terrorists had taken over, just as Michael and his group were about to leave. A sudden burst of gunfire hit Sid, critically wounding him. It turns out that Cyclops has caught up with them and he has heard the news that they are going to the airport. So Cyclops calls his associates at the airport. At that moment, the injured Sid, enduring the pain, knocked down Cyclops, interrupting their communication, only to be stabbed by Cyclops. Bearing the severe pain, Sid handcuffed himself to Cyclops. Michael and the others hurried over to help. But by then, Sid had already passed away. Seeing Cyclops grinning, Michael angrily punched him in the head. But to catch the plane as soon as possible, they had to leave Sid behind and continue on their way. Meanwhile, terrorists at the airport were gathering trucks to block the runway, leaving no chance for takeoff. Benjamin pleaded with the pilot to wait another five minutes, but seeing more and more trucks, the pilot decisively started the plane. Leaving my friend! Shut it down! Shut it down! You stop me? No one gets out. Your friends can still make it to safety. We will not. At that moment, Benjamin's phone rang, seeing the terrorists chasing the plane relentlessly. Lincoln told them to escape quickly while he thought of another plan. They watched the plane fly over their heads, a tribute to the ending of the first season. Sheba answers the phone and tells Lincoln to find Omar, but he can't hear him clearly because of the noise. Seeing the terrorists' vehicles closing in, they quickly turned and continued to run for their lives. They dodged the terrorists' pursuit all the way and finally arrived at an abandoned warehouse. If they couldn't come up with an escape plan, their deaths would be even more gruesome than those of the people outside. At that moment, Lincoln suddenly remembered Sheba's friend Omar, who wasn't the most reliable but was now their only hope for a way out. They quickly found Omar packing his bags and explained their reason for coming. Omar said he would take them along for Sheba's sake, but with only one car and not enough space for everyone, he told them to drive his other vehicle, a land cruiser. Michael kept Whip to watch over Omar and went with Lincoln and Shah to get the car. After they left, Omar took the opportunity to knock Whip out when he wasn't looking, just as Michael and the others found the car. Terrorists caught up with them. Lincoln, with his superb driving skills, quickly lost the terrorists. By then, Whip had been tied up, revealing that Omar had no intention of taking them along. Seeing Lincoln arriving in the Land Cruiser, Omar hurriedly tried to drive away, but was quickly pulled out of the car by the agile Lincoln. Whip was ready to teach Omar a lesson, but Ja intervened just in time, reminding them they still needed Omar to escape Yemen. Omar mentioned he was planning to go to Fakes, over 400 kilometers away, where the people were simple and there was no war. The journey required crossing a vast desert, and without a map, only he knew the route. They immediately set off on their escape. Meanwhile, the two assassins who had received orders to kill Michael were heading to the NSA to use their satellite surveillance to locate Michael and his team. Since AW had once worked at the NSA, she got her former colleague Gloria to help. But Gloria could only allow them limited access as observers. Just then, Lincoln received a call from Sheba. It turned out that several people under the leadership of Benjamin has arrived safely in Jordan tomorrow ready to fly to the United States. She thanked Lincoln and said that when we meet, we will buy Lincoln a drink. But this call allowed the NSA to track their location. Soon, a drone followed them. Though Michael and his team were completely unaware, they stopped at a roadside gas station to fill up the tank due to the long journey ahead. While filling up Michael goes to an internet cafe inside the petrol station where he connects with a man called Blue Hawaii, who can free him from the seven years of Poseidon's control. Van Gogh called the terrorists and gave them Michael and his team's precise location. Meanwhile, Michael and his team were basking in the joy of almost escaping Yemen. Suddenly, they saw two vehicles full of armed terrorists approaching. Lincoln dropped the fuel pump and urgently called for Michael, but Michael was still busy inside. He hurriedly asked Blue Hawaii to take a screenshot of the tattoo on his hand. Whip found Omar's gun, but Omar said it only had one bullet, intended for his suicide if captured by terrorists. At that moment, Omar suddenly fell, shot. The others used the car for cover, just when they thought they were doomed. The quick-thinking Whip spotted a fuel tanker near the terrorists and decisively fired the only bullet. The exploding tanker instantly blew the terrorists away, as they were just catching their breath. A red SUV approached from a distance, with no choice. They continued their escape by car. However, they hadn't gone far when Michael stopped the car. As their guide, Omar, was dead. They gave him a simple burial. Just as they were planning their next move, a burst of gunfire came their way again, forcing them back into the car to flee. This scene was also captured by the drone. AW demanded to continue the tracking but was stopped by Gloria, who realized that this was not surveillance but murder. 
They were quickly thrown out by the NSA after their plot was exposed. Michael stopped the car again after driving some distance because the sun was directly overhead, making it impossible to discern directions. Cha's phone had also lost signal, and when they got out, they realized their tires had betrayed their location. Michael took out a telescope and saw that it was Cyclops, the killer of Sid. At that time, Cyclops stopped to refuel his car, knowing his fuel would outlast Michael's, ensuring he could follow them until their fuel ran out. Michael took out a hose, planning to siphon fuel from the white Land Cruiser into the black SUV. Allowing the SUV to reach the destination, they decided to leave a small amount of gasoline in the white Land Cruiser, which would be driven by one person to lure the enemy away. For fairness, Michael brought four stones, three red and one white. Whoever drew the white stone would be responsible for luring the enemy. Coincidentally, the others all drew red stones, leaving the white one in Michael's hand. Lincoln was unwilling to let Michael take the risk and wanted to swap, but Michael convinced him otherwise, saying he still had the crucial task of finding their destination. Michael asked them to leave marks to help him find them later, and then they set off. Cyclops relentlessly pursued from behind. At that moment, Michael suddenly crossed in front of Cyclops, who naturally followed. Michael then took out a red stone he had in his hand, revealing there was never a white stone. He had devised the plan to protect those around him from threat. As the fuel in the car was nearly exhausted, Michael found cover behind an obstacle. Cyclops quickly lost sight of his target. Holding his AK-47, he meticulously searched but found the target vehicle slowly moving away. So he hurriedly drove after it. Soon, Michael's car came to a stop. Cyclops, with a smirk on his face, slowly approached with his gun drawn, only to find the car empty except for a stone pressed on the accelerator pedal. By then, Michael had already sneaked into Cyclops' car. Hearing the engine roar, Cyclops turned and sprayed bullets wildly with his machine gun. Michael took the opportunity to grab a screwdriver from the car door and quickly hit at the back of the car, attacking Cyclops from the roof when he was unguarded. The two engaged in a life-or-death duel, evenly matched until both collapsed. Michael then used the screwdriver to pierce Cyclops' remaining eye. However, as Michael stood up, Cyclops stabbed him in the abdomen with a dagger coated in antifreeze. Ignoring the pain, Michael rushed to find Lincoln but soon had to abandon the broken-down car and proceed on foot. Meanwhile, Lincoln and the others found the place Omar had spoken of, a peaceful haven compared to war-torn Yemen, but they couldn't be happy because Michael had not yet returned. As night fell, Michael struggled through the desert, his infected wound causing him to collapse several times, until he finally fell unconscious. Images from his past flashed before Michael's eyes, wondering if these were the signs of death approaching. Just as he closed his eyes, the sound of fireworks nearby reignited hope in his heart. Signals set off by Lincoln for his brother. Lincoln climbed to the roof of the car shouting Michael's name. Michael! Michael! <sighs> but did not get the slightest response. Just as Lincoln was about to give up hope, someone saw Michael staggering back, barely alive. Michael collapsed on the ground, and Lincoln along with the others hurriedly rushed to his side. Michael told Lincoln that he had been poisoned and needed to be taken to a hospital as soon as possible, but there was no doctor in their small tribe. The only doctor is in the city they just escaped from, but it's impossible for them to go back now. Without a new plan for treatment, Michael would soon die from the poisoning.